Welcome to CFRI Cystic Fibrosis Community Voices, a video podcast series created by and for the cystic fibrosis community. Hello, everyone. I'm Siri Vaith, Executive Director of the Cystic Fibrosis Research Institute, CFRI, and I welcome you to our CF Community Voices podcast program. I'm looking forward to today's presentation with Leah Webb on nourishing a family through disease. Before we get started, I want to remind people that the information shared in this podcast is not to be used for medical advice diagnosis or treatment, and if you're going to make any changes in your medical plan, uh, please consult with your team prior to making those changes. I want to thank our sponsors who've made this podcast possible, including Vertex Pharmaceuticals, Genentech, Chiesi USA, Beatrice, and Gilead Sciences. And now it is my delight and my honor to introduce Leah Webb. Leah describes herself as a mom, author, gardener, and all-around family food enthusiast. She has a Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Ecology, a Master's of Public Health, and is a certified health coach. She and her husband have a son with severe anaphylactic food allergies and a daughter with cystic fibrosis. Realizing the importance of diet on her children's health and the cultural norms that discourage healthy food habits, she developed food strategies that are enjoyable, engaging, and nurture healthy habits. She started writing her cookbook in 2017 and now focuses on writing, public speaking, and online offerings. We are so delighted to have you with us today. Welcome, Leah. Thanks for having me, Siri. I'm so looking forward to speaking with the CF community and uh, just getting the opportunity to share some of the work that we've done in my family with others who may be interested in doing something similar. All right, well, welcome everyone. And thank you so much for joining me and just giving me the opportunity to get to share some of what is important to me and my family as far as supporting my kids' health. And so as, as Siri already wonderfully introduced, I have two kids. Um, Owen, who has severe food allergies, and those have drastically improved over time, but he is still severely allergic to wheat and barley, which has really dictated a lot of the way that we are able to do social interactions and uh, being able to eat out. And so really kind of a, a heavy thing to deal with at times. And then my daughter, June, who is five now, was born with cystic fibrosis. Um, and then this is a picture of my husband, just so you could see all of us. And he's always behind the camera, so it's very rare that we actually get a photo of him. Um, but he is on board with all of our, with the dietary approach that I have implemented for my kids and, and using this as part of our integrative care. So this, of course, is not the only piece of care that we're utilizing. Uh, we're, you know, my daughter is on Kaleidoco, she's Pulmazine, hypertonic saline, all of the things that most people with cystic fibrosis are using, but we also use diet as part of our complementary therapy. So after she was born, our diet did shift a bit. We were already following a restrictive diet because of my son. And, and when he was younger, there was really a pretty big list of food that he was not able to eat. Um, that has improved, as I already said, but after my daughter was born and learning that antibiotics would be such an important piece of her care and that really that was, that was necessary and it wasn't something that I could get around. And then knowing too, the importance of having a healthy microbiome and, and what it is that all of those the microbiota that resides in your gut, what are all of the benefits that it has for your body? Now we know that having a healthy gut can be linked to, um, to disease and health. And so I wanted to figure out a way that I could support her while knowing that she was going to most likely uh, require a lifetime of medication. Um, and so that's where I found the GAPS diet, which is gut and psychology syndrome. And you can find out more information about that online, it's the developer is named Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride. And basically Dr. Campbell McBride noticed that her patients who had ADHD and autism and schizophrenia and these different psychological issues that they also had a gut imbalance. And so she developed this diet as a, a complementary therapy in the treatment of their conditions. So I did a little bit of a modified gap when I was introducing solids to my daughter. And, and what we ended up settling on was grain-free, dairy-free, sugar-free. 
And I ended up writing a cookbook about it because one of the things that I found is when you do embark on these restrictive diets is that oftentimes people are making recommendations for these substitutes that are low in nutritional value. And my approach has always been that when you're treating a disease or any type of condition, that your body really needs the most nutrient dense foods that you can possibly get. And so I wanted to create a resource for people who wanted to follow a restrictive diet, but wanted to do it in a way in which they were really nourishing themselves. They were eating lots of whole foods, and then they were also trying to simplify this process along the way. Um, so the benefits that we've noticed for this, and it's so hard to know with my daughter because she's young, and, and when kids are young, there's such minimal feedback that they're able to actually provide you with. So you know, whether it's her genetics or it's Kaleidico or some of these other, other medications that we're using to support her health or how much of that has been from diet, it is really hard to tease apart. But I do know that she has been extremely healthy. And, and I do attribute some of that to our focus on nutrient density. Um, for my son, his health has drastically improved. Um, he is now off of all of his asthma medications, which um, he started taking asthma medications when he was probably 18 months old, maybe even a little bit younger. So his lung problem started pretty, pretty young for, um, you know, and they were pretty significant. And so, so this diet really has helped support us um, and not just my daughter, but the entire family. So, but before I get into some of the details around why it is or how it is that I made this diet a little bit easier, I do want to talk about shifting the psychology around food because I think oftentimes when we hear about restrictive diets and we think about dieting and um, trying to cut out sugar or trying to cut out certain foods, we really just focus on the restriction about it. And I think that there is such a benefit to restrictive eating, um, but we really have to hone in on that psychology and start to change the conversation in our head around why it is that we would be following a restrictive diet. Um, so there are a couple of um, a couple of terms that I like to use when thinking about food. And the first one is this idea of nourishing choices. Um, so when you're thinking about, well, what is it that I'm going to eat? You can say, well, what is the most nourishing choice in this moment? So it doesn't even have to be an umbrella um, you know, long-term thing. I mean, it can be a long-term question. What is the most nourishing choice long-term? But it can be used on an individual basis. So let's say you're at a party and you've decided that you really want to cut out sugar. Um, but then you're at a party and cake is served and you think about the emotional piece of wanting to enjoy cake with your friends. And so then you say, well, what is the most nourishing choice? And in that moment, it might be to eat the cake and then get back to being sugar-free later. Or it could be that the most nourishing choice is that every time you eat sugar, the consequences are too high. And so even though you would enjoy eating that piece of cake, it, the more nourishing choice might be to say no. So using that term and thinking about, thinking about your food choices, not in a restrictive way, but as in, in a nourishing way. And what, is it that, what are the choices that you can do to support your body? Um, so you can use loving boundaries in a very similar way. Um, with the party example, maybe it's that the loving boundary is that when you're at the house, you eliminate sugar. But then when you go out with friends, you really don't worry about it so much. Um, so, so I think that when you think about food using, especially those two terms, I feel like those are the most two hopeful, helpful that you can use are nourishing choices and loving boundaries. When you use those two terms and thinking about your food choices, all of a sudden it is you're taking the power back and you're deciding what it is that supports you in the best way. And that choice can really vary from situation to situation. Um, so then when you start thinking about food that way, restrictive diets don't feel as restrictive. They actually feel like they're really supporting your body in the things that it needs. Um, so, and then thinking about focusing on the addition and not just the subtraction. When we say, I'm not gonna eat grains, dairy, and sugar, all of a sudden we draw a blank and think, or whatever the diet is that you're feeling that you need to follow. You feel like, oh my goodness, how am I supposed to not eat X, Y, and Z? I mean, what else can there possibly be that I'll eat? So I always encourage people to make a list of the foods that they are going to eat. So you can have eggs and uh, whatever it is that you really enjoy. I've, I'm a real egg lover, so that's why I, I threw that example out. But if you make this list and think about all the possibilities of things that you're gonna be able to add into your diet and not just think about the things that you're gonna be excluding. And then what'll happen, 
So then if you start to add those things in, add them in, add them in, you automatically start crowding out the foods that you might not want to be eating. So let's say your goal is to eat more vegetables in a day. So you start, you focus on the addition. You focus on, well, at breakfast, I'm going to add some spinach in. At dinner, I'm going to add in a salad. And when you make space for those foods, you have less space for the other foods. Um, so really try to focus on changing your psychology around healthy eating, just so that it does, it feels, I want it to feel something that feels good to you, that feels like it's supporting your body. So for us, the choice that we made, as I already mentioned, was really just to focus on nutrient density. Um, and so I don't think that the specific diet that you follow really matters so much. I think that we're all individuals. Everybody has individual needs that need to be met. And so while this diet might have, may have worked really well in our instance, it might be something else that works really well in your case. But whatever it is, focus on the nutrient density, focus on those foods that are going to give your body the nourishment that they need. They're gonna give you the vitamins and the minerals and the macronutrients and the phytonutrients, all of those things that your body needs to combat disease and, and to work to heal itself. Um, and because medications are such a big part of managing disease, medications have side effects. And so when you, when you incorporate all of these fresh fruits and vegetables and, and nutrient dense foods, I feel like you're giving your body more of the things it needs uh, to repair itself and to keep supporting you even while taking all of those medications as well. Um, so as Siri also mentioned, one of the things that I have really focused on is growing a lot of our own food. And it's because it feels, it, it's so enjoyable to me. I really love gardening. Um, I do let my daughter garden with me, so we do have some rules about washing hands and things like that when she gets done, um, but I have found that this is such a, a magnificent tool to get kids especially interested in eating healthy foods, and not just the kids, but adults. When you watch the foods that you're able to grow and you plant a seed and you watch that turn into something that you can then consume, I mean, it's miraculous. It's really mind blowing and it feels so good to be able to nourish your body in that way and even just to connect to your surroundings more. So one of the things that I had to work on with this restrictive diet was that I really needed to streamline the meal prep process. And the reason for that is because when you are cooking from scratch and making all of these whole foods, it can be exhausting. And I wanted it to be, I wanted it to feel good. I needed it to feel nourishing. I needed to be getting the nutrient dense foods that I really wanted to be serving to my family. But at the same time, I didn't want this to be all consuming. I didn't want it to completely consume my life. Um, so meal planning was hugely helpful in this effort. And the reason that I like meal planning so much is because you make the, you sit down when you have time to make your plan. You go grocery shopping just once to fulfill all the needs. And then you don't have this conundrum every evening where you're thinking, well, what am I gonna eat? Oh gosh, we're hungry again. This only happens 365 days a year, yet we still can't quite get on top of figuring out what it is we're gonna eat. So when you have a meal plan, you're able to look at it and just say, well, this is what we're gonna eat because this is what I planned for and, these, and this is what I already bought the ingredients for. Um, and in that meal plan, I do think that it's really important to plan for days off. When we first started this diet, I was cooking breakfast, lunch, and dinner from scratch seven days a week, and I got burnt out. So what I started to do is to factor in a free night. And so I found some frozen pizzas that everyone's able to eat, and they're not dairy-free, but they are grain-free. So we stayed within the boundaries that were really important for my family to follow. And, and that was our night off because it is hard to eat out with my son because of his allergies. And so I needed something that I could serve in my home that felt convenient and gave me a break. Um, so when you first start cooking from scratch, it may be that you need four nights off and maybe you need five nights off. Maybe it's that you still need to be eating cereal every single morning for breakfast. I think be realistic about how much you're able to cook and what it is that you're able to produce and then be okay with filling in the blanks with days off and whatever foods it is that you need to use for your bridge foods. Um, and perhaps that's, that's all you want to do is just maybe it's that you commit to making a really large salad every week and that this is how you start to crowd out those other foods. And then these other nights you're, or, and then you're still filling in with some of the packaged or restaurant bought foods. So I think plan for those days off and be realistic with whatever it is you need. Um, I already touched on bulk shopping. Um, 
just going to the grocery store once and then, um, you know, buying things in bulk, buying, for example, we buy grass fed beef from a local farm and I buy, um, you know, 30 to 50 pounds of beef at a time, just because I don't want to have to be going back to that farm every single time I need beef. I would like to be able to put a stockpile in the freezer and then I can just pull from it as I need it, which ultimately is going to save time. Um, and in the same way, if you're going to be bulk prepping, if you're going to be prepping foods for the week, think big. So for example, I have this salad here. This is one of kind of my signature moves that I like to make is to make an enormous salad that serves about 20 people. And then this is what we eat all week because it didn't take me much longer to make this huge salad than it would have just to make a single serving salad. Um, and then always remember that cooking fresh is a choice and it's not an obligation. If you were choosing to start cooking more from scratch, try not to get stuck in the trap of feeling like I have to do this. Oh, what a burden this is. Um, because this is something that I can do. And so this is, this is one of the things I remind myself is that I am making a choice to nourish my family in this way. I am making this choice and I can make this choice differently at any point in time. And again, I think when you, when you realize that this is something you want to be doing, it makes it feel more sustainable. So focus on the joy, what attracts you to eating healthfully. And I think that we live in a society that is so focused on outward appearance and weight and some of these physical measures of health. But I think that health is an eternal, it's an internal feeling. It's something that can't always be measured on the outside. And focusing on those factors, I feel like are highly motivating even more so than the weight loss and some of the other benefits that you get from eating healthfully that may appear on the outside. So really think about what it is that you want out of, uh, out of diet and how it is that you want it to support you. Um, what is it that, that inspires you to pursue health? So for me, a big part of it is I am so inspired by my garden. I'm so inspired by watching these foods grow. And then I have all of this food and then I have to figure out a way to use it. <laughs> um, and so that really keeps me, it, it's so inspiring for me. Um, and then what do you do when the joy is lost? What do you do when I was saying when you start to feel like it's an obligation and it's a burden and it gets so heavy to carry? And what I would like to remind everybody is that food is just one piece of the puzzle. Um, so personalized health means doing what feels good for you. So I have this, um, this is a tool that I used in health coaching called the circle of life. And, and basically what you can see is that home cooking is just one piece of the pie here. So when you start to feel like cooking is becoming more burdensome than it is beneficial, it might take time to step back and think about all of these other factors that go into having a healthy lifestyle. How are your relationships? Are you being nourished in that way? Are you finding joy and creativity? How are your finances? Are you satisfied with your career and your education? Um, so when you start to feel that food is burdensome, I try to step back and say, well, A, this is a choice I'm making and would I like to make a different choice? Do I want to, what are those nourishing choices? And then what are some of the other factors that I might be missing out on right now? So I hope that was, um, I hope that was beneficial for everybody. And so Siri, I'd love to have, I'd love to um, answer any questions you might've had about anything I said, or if you want to expand on any of those topics as well. well first, thank you so much. That was very inspirational. Those photos are absolutely gorgeous. I think everybody wishes they had a plot of land now to go grow those gorgeous vegetables. Amazing. So and a uh, and a husband with a camera is helpful as well. <laughs> <laughs> He's an amazing photographer. That looked looked great. I loved the um, the blend of finding joy in doing this. The fact the the psychology of food, because as we know, that is food is such a psychological issue, whether you're trying to gain weight, whether you're trying to lose weight, whether you're trying to eat a healthier diet, um, and just having that sense of taking control in a very positive, nurturing way um, without uh, the rigidity, I think is an incredibly helpful message. I'm curious how you work with your daughter's health team, the nutritionist at 
and dietitian at the CF Center. And how much is there a partnership in, in the discussion about your daughter's diet? So we actually started at one clinic and then moved to another clinic. And so in those early years when you're so heavily, you know, in those early years, you, I feel like you're spending so much time with all of the different, um, with the respiratory therapists, the nutritionists, everybody is in there a lot. And, um, and to be honest, her and I actually did not agree on, on my approach. So she really felt like dairy was an important piece of getting enough fat in somebody's diet. Um, and she also felt like adding sugar to food was a way to coax my daughter into eating more. Um, and so I felt very strongly that those early years with kids, especially, that when you start setting these standards and, and, and by no means am I being judgmental about anybody who may have done this because I do understand how hard it is to get kids to eat healthy. And I think I am just incredibly stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> and just felt that it was really important that I wanted my daughter to be eating whole real foods. And I wanted to be trying to add in the healthy fats that I thought were really important and really valuable and to avoid sugar and, and to also teach her how to respect her hunger levels, which um, I also feel like we're in a different situation in which my daughter is pancreas sufficient. And so we never dealt with some of those same weight loss issues. She was pretty small there for a little while. I'd say for about a year, she was at the bottom of the growth chart. But um, so we kind of had this agreement that I made with the nutritionist that I wanted to do things my way. And that if things were not working after a couple of, you know, after a year, or if things got to a point where she was, it was dangerous, that I would adjust. Um, but it worked itself out over time. Now she's in the 85th percentile. I mean, she's always been, you know, she's a big kid and she, and she will eat all of these different foods because I was so stubborn about it in the beginning. And, and now the nutritionist that we have actually, she's been a lot more supportive of this. And so I think, I think it really depends on the person you get and what their approach is and how comfortable they are with trying some of these different things that they may not be familiar with. Um, but I will say, I think one of the things that was helpful with this other nutritionist is that her daughter didn't have CF, but she had a severe dairy allergy. So she was used to substituting fats without dairy. And so she understood it a little better. Well, I think it is a whole new realm in, in the area of nutrition, especially with CFTR modulators. So for people who are pancreatic insufficient, who spent their entire lives being told to eat whatever they could eat to calorie load, fat load, even sugar load, uh, now, for those who are able to use, in particular, Trikafta, it's been a huge shift um, because the dietary habits are ingrained from years and years. And you know, everybody jokes about the COVID-15. Well, it's a whole Trikafta you know, 15 for many people and a whole shift, I think, for a lot of care teams to work with patients to figure out new ways to look at nutrition. Well, and I also think that some of the life expectancy for CF is increasing with these modulators. And so I think that, you know, a lot of these foods that um, have been pushed for so long that are calorie dense and, uh, you know, high in fats and high in sugar and just trying to get people to eat, a lot of these foods, what we know is that they're actually disease causing and that for a healthy adult to eat all of these foods over their lifetime when as they get older they can suffer from diabetes and heart disease and and different conditions and and so I think that the thought process oftentimes was let's just keep them alive let's just get calories in them and I think now the conversation needs to be okay well if they if if these modulators are improving life expectancy well how do we really nourish people with cystic fibrosis and how do we keep them healthy and how do we teach them how to eat nourishing foods so that they prevent these other diseases later in life. Can you talk a bit about um, foods and inflammation and the correlation between them? Yeah, so this is kind of, and so the tricky thing with foods and inflammation is that it can be a very individualized thing. Um, and this was some of the reason that we decided to avoid grains, dairy, and sugar. These are pro-inflammatory foods for a lot of people. Uh, grains can be, 
brains, grains and really dairy as well. They can be prepared in different ways in which they're not pro-inflammatory, um, but generally the way that we're eating grains is highly processed, usually with a lot of sugar, and, and these can be inflammatory. So what they can do is they can interact with the lining of your gut um, and they can actually pull things out of your gut into your bloodstream. And I won't go into too much detail about this. I'll kind of just give a quick broad overview, but they can pull things that are in your, in your gut that are not yet ready to be used. They're not yet usable nutrition. They can pull them across the gut lining into your bloodstream. And once they're in your bloodstream, your body will recognize that as some type of foreign invader. And then it'll elicit an immune response. And so when you're eating these foods repeatedly over time, you basically have this low grade inflammatory response that your body is producing pretty frequently. So, um, eggs can be an inflammatory food for other people, nuts. I mean, I think uh, nightshades, things like tomatoes and peppers. And so I think experimenting with your diet and figuring out what it is that really has an impact for your individual system can be really beneficial. The one food that I think across the board should be avoided by most people, including healthy individuals, is sugar. Um, sugar has a measurable inflammatory response. It also interacts with proteins it can, um, and forms substances called advanced glycation end products. And advanced glycation end products have been associated with a, a range of diseases. Um, so there is no direct link between sugar, advanced glycation end products, and disease, but there is a link between sugar, advanced glycation end products, and advanced glycation end products and disease. And so in my mind, when you think about the World Health Organization and the American Heart Association, all these limits they've put on sugar and how we have surpassed all of them. Um, and then we are a sick population, six in 10 adults is living with a chronic disease, uh, a preventable chronic disease. And so, so my thought is that when you are thinking about diet and inflammation, sugar is the, is the starting point in, in my mind. And then, and then possibly explore some of these other foods after that. Our mutual friend, Stacy had a great question, which was to um, describe the difference between nourishment and nutrition. That is such a good question. Um, so I think, I think when you're talking about nutrition, you're talking about your macronutrients, which are your proteins, your fats, your carbohydrates, your vitamins, your minerals. And nutritionism feels very um, compartmentalized to me in that you're really just focusing on these pieces rather than focusing on the whole picture. And so when I think about nourishment, I am thinking about my macronutrients. I'm thinking about my vitamins and my minerals, but I'm also thinking about the things that maybe we can't see, such as phytonutrients and phytochemicals that are in plants and how it is that these, these chemicals have beneficial effects on our body that we may, we, we don't know, we haven't recognized. There's a way that foods nourish us that can't always be measured. Um, and some of those are psychological as well. So, so in this example that I keep using about going to the party and eating the cake, you know, if you're going to this party and you're not eating the cake and then you feel terrible about that, that's not nourishment. That's not a nourishing choice. I mean, one of the things Stacy and I talked about one time is people who go on vacation and just gorge themselves and then they never gain any weight, um, you know, but then they come home and if they ate like that normally, they would. It's, it's because of the emotions around the food. And so that's where I think that the difference between nutrition and nourishment comes in is that nourishment is a holistic view of food and how it interacts with your body while nutrition is really just kind of breaking it down into its pieces rather than thinking about it as a whole. Well, we're wrapping up. We have time for one last question and that would be, what is the one thing you wish everyone would carry away from this podcast? I think it's that to be um, gentle with yourself in knowing that food is so nourishing and it is so important, but there are many reasons that people choose to eat the ways that they do. Uh, whether it's that it's a financial stress, it's a, somebody doesn't have enough time to be cooking foods. 
uh, that they, they didn't understand what they may have done when they made a certain choice that they regretted later on. I think that we get so wrapped up in doing the right thing and what it is that we're supposed to be doing that we forget how, that we just forget to be gentle with ourselves. And we forget that there are, are a lot of good reasons to do a lot of things and that we should make the choices that feel most nourishing to us and change that choice at any point in time if it's no longer serving us in the way that we had hoped. Thank you, Leah. You've left us with so much to think about. Uh, and I really hope this encourages many people, myself included, uh, to explore the links between good nutrition um, and also self-nourishment. This has been incredibly helpful. So thank you for being here. And thanks again to our sponsors, Vertex, Kia's USA, Gilead Sciences, Beatrice, and Genentech. To everyone, stay safe and be well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Siri.